In this video, we'll talk about the best proven scientific methods that you can use to find your art style in a matter of weeks, months, years, depending on how much time that you put in. And the methods explained in this video are both for beginners as well as for artists, professional artists who have 20, 30, 40 years of experience. Let's dive in. The first thing that you want to do is to copy the masters. And when we look at those masters, we see that those masters also copied the masters. If we look at Claude Monet, for example, in his Déjeuner sur l'herbe, we see that he copied Monet. If we look at Gauguin's work, we see that he copied Olympias Monet, who was already a copy of Venus of Urbino from Titian. And so we see that these masters copy paste each other all of the time. And so what do you do when you want to copy the masters? Well, you can start with creating an archive on your computer where you collect all the artists that inspire you from Instagram, from magazines, from books, from wherever you want. And then on a fixed day of the week, you will go to that archive and you will just create art based on whatever you see. And when it comes to copying, you have basically two options. You can either copy literal, as I did here, for example, with Matisse, or you can copy in a less literal way where you only copy, for example, the composition as we saw with the Venus of Urbino, Manes Olympia, things like that. They copy the composition and then they give it their own twist. Another version of this is to copy paste parts, literal, and then adding your own twist afterwards. A good example is an artwork that I made from a drawing of Van Gogh. For those of you who don't know, Van Gogh was famous for drawing worker type of people. And so what I did is I drew a worker type of people in a 21st century way with a Burger King hat on. And so what is the main benefit of doing this? Well, while you are letting yourself be inspired by the masters, you are letting yourself be inspired by the best parts of art history. And so the art styles that you develop afterwards will be in line with the canon of the arts. It will be in line with those best parts of history. And so now you are increasing the quality of that art style that you develop, but also, and this is very important, also you are making it easy for art critics and art historians to write about your work, to link your work to art history. And when it is easier for them to write about it, they will write more about it. And when they are writing more about it, you increase the value of your artwork. And so this is a very long-term smart approach to making art. The next tip is based on a study I read in Creative Superpowers and what they did was they asked people to come up with the most amount of creative solutions, creative ideas with two cups that they were given and to one of the groups they asked to copy paste numbers from one sheet to another sheet while they were doing that exercise, while they were coming up with ideas for those two cups. And to the other group, they didn't ask anything. They had all of the time in the world to just focus on coming up with creative ideas. And what they found was, and this is very interesting, what they found was that the people who had to do the boring task, copy pasting numbers from one sheet to another sheet, came up with more creative ideas, came up with more creative solutions to use those cups. Now the researchers explained this phenomenon in the following way. They said that the brain was so eager to do something else than the boring task of copy-pasting numbers, the soul-crushing task of copy-pasting numbers was so, so unattractive to the brain that it desperately wanted to do something else, desperately wanted to do that other task which was coming up with creative ways, creative solutions, creative things to do with those cops. And so what can we learn from this? Well, we can learn from this that we want to allow some kind of boredom into our studio process, into our creative process, and we definitely want to take away all types of interesting distractions like social media, cell phones, computer games, Netflix, whatever you're doing that might be more interesting during particular times than making art. Because if it's interesting or more interesting than making art, then your brain will want to be doing that. In the back of your brain, the subconscious part will be will be playing that video game that you're doing or will be thinking about the movie that you just watched or that, that series that you just watched. And it will not be busy with making that art style that could potentially be revolutionary. And then there's another study I read in Creative Superpowers that was also very interesting. They tested people while they were drawing to see how easy it was for them to come up with creative drawings and they put them in different rooms. One group of people they put in a a clean room, very neat, very organized, very structured. And the other group of people, they put in a very messy room that was just disorganized, full of chaos. And what they found was that the people in that chaotic room, in that messy room, were coming up with more creative drawings than the people in the clean room. And so what does this suggest? It suggests that our brains benefit from some kind of randomness, some kind of chaos, because it triggers parts of the brain and it promotes cross-pollination. It promotes connections 
inside of your brain. And so what does this mean in a more practical way? Well, stop spending time cleaning your studio and start spending time decorating your studio. Start spending time making, creating some kind of deliberate chaos that could stimulate you, that, that could stimulate your brain. And how can you know if a thing stimulates your brain? Well, you just look at it. If it's interesting to you, if you somehow like it, if it somehow triggers something inside of you, chances are it is stimulating your brain in that moment. And when we look at this study, this also makes a lot of sense because when we look at the most famous artists of our times, for example, we see messy studios full of chaotic products and, 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 and objects all over the place. And not just with artists, also with creative entrepreneurs. If you look at uh, Steve Jobs, Mark Zuckerberg, for example, they were notoriously famous for their messy desks and they could only work at messy desks. Why? It's very unclear why, but with this study, kind of suggests that this messiness stimulates a brain in some kind of way that is just beneficial for coming up with solutions, coming up with creative new ways of doing things. Now the next step is based on the study I read in Unlocking Creativity by Michael Roberto and this is one of the most beautiful studies I've ever read in my life, one of the most powerful studies. And so here's what they did. They asked a bunch of MBAs, newly graduates from business schools to solve the following puzzle. They gave them 18 straws of spaghetti, hard straws of spaghetti and one marshmallow and they had to build the biggest construction that they could come up with. And there was one rule, they had to put the marshmallow all the way on top. And because these business MBAs were taught planning structures and budgeting structures and, and linear ways of doing stuff with calendars and stepping plans and all of that stuff, they started using those tools and they came up with a stepping plan. They had particular assumptions that they wanted to test out and then they, they followed it step by step and lo and behold, some got a decent construction, some didn't got a decent construction, some put the marshmallow on top and it fell off and all that stuff. Now, the interesting part of this study is that they asked the same thing to a bunch of six-year-olds. And the six-year-olds did something completely different. They didn't follow their stepping plan with budgeting structures and all of that stuff. No, they just went in and tried. They just went in and tried. And then when a construction didn't really work properly, they changed it up. Some other kid came with another idea. Hey, can we test this out and this out and this out? And lo and behold, the six-year-olds completely crushed the MBAs. They didn't have the training, they didn't have the degrees, they didn't even have developed brain shed or fully developed brain shed, yet they won. They crushed the MBAs into pieces. And so why is this? Well, one of the reasons is of course that the schooling system is complete crap and one big scam. I have a video about that, link it in the i cards in the description, but that's a completely different thing. On a serious note, why is this? It's because the six-year-olds used a different approach. They went for an iterative approach where they tested out things, then took the things that worked, threw away the things that didn't work, and tried again with slightly improved designs. And over a particular period of time, this resulted, this process resulted in a better solution. And so what can we learn out of this? Well, we have to use that iterative approach. We have to just, in the end, simply make art. You can't think your way into creating an art style. You have to make art and then take the things that work that you like and throw away the rest and then do that again with new things and new things and new things and over a particular period of time this will result in an amazing art style. Picasso once said that it took him four years to learn how to draw like Raphael but a lifetime to learn how to draw like a child. I'm not sure what he meant with that and nobody is but perhaps he meant this. Perhaps he meant that it took him a while to learn the iterative approach of just doing, just making art and then changing things up. And it's not a coincidence that Picasso out of all artists made a crazy amount of artworks. I'm not, I'm not sure how much, I think it's 5,000 pieces of art, which is about two pieces every single day. And so it's creating. It's making art, that's the solution, that's, that's where everything happens. For the next tip I want to tell you the story of George de Mestral who in 1940 went on a hunting trip and during his hunting trip he noticed that burrs of a particular plant stuck to his clothing and it took him a while to get it off his clothing and it was such an annoying task that it kind of caught his attention and he thought you know what I'm gonna take these burrs with me at home and, and then watch them under a microscope and what he saw under that microscope when he came home was that there were tiny little hooks in these burrs that attached them to the tiny little loops of fabric in his clothing. Bam! 
the idea of the Velcro was born right there. He got a patent, developed the company, and in 1998, he made $93 million of this one moment in time, this one idea. And so what can we learn from this? Well, it speaks for itself that the Mestral would have never come up with this idea if he didn't follow his curiosity, if he didn't went on that hunting trip, if he didn't took those birds with him to his home and then put them on a microscope. And so what, what should we do? We should allow cross-pollination to happen by allowing ourselves to mind wander, by allowing ourselves to procrastinate, by allowing ourselves to do activities that have nothing to do with art, following our curiosity. The truth is that creativity does not happen in the 14 hour workaholic day where you just mindlessly try to chase money, chase work, chase achievements. It, it, it just doesn't happen there. And so this toxic 14 hour workaholic lifestyle is just not a lifestyle for an artist to, to follow. And sadly enough, it's a lifestyle that is being promoted at this time in the world globally. The next tip is based on a study I read in the small big where they took groups of people and put them in different rooms. One room was a normal room and then the other room had a very low ceiling, in other words a very unpleasant room and they tested how creative these people were. And lo and behold, as you probably expect, the room with the low ceiling that was unpleasant had the least creative people and the least creative outcomes and the room that was normal had the best outcomes, the best creative outcomes. And so what can we learn from this? Well. You have to choose the best room in your home. And the best thing to do is probably to just sacrifice everything and take your living room and use that because it's probably the most pleasant room in your house. But perhaps you don't want to be that no-lifer that doesn't invite anyone to his place because it's full of hard stuff. Um, guilty as charged. And in that scenario, there are some things that you can do. You can choose a room, for example, that has a window that is somewhat pleasant, a room that is not extremely hot like an attic in the summer or extremely cold like a basement that is that is with moisture and, and things like that. No, just to choose a pleasant room. And if you don't have that, which is possible, let's say you're a student or you, you live with your parents or you, you live with a lot of other people and you just don't have that room available, be aware of that and go outside, do some plein air work, go to a coffee shop and let yourself be inspired by the coffee for example or go to a library or go to a place that you will not be able to paint in a library I know but you can do some research there you can let your particular parts of your creative process can happen in a library even when you're a painter even when you are a sculptor even when you are a dancer and if none of these things work, then you can also choose to apply for artist residencies where you will have a beautiful room, beautiful view, oftentimes even in villas with nature and like beautiful places that are very inspiring. If you're interested in that and you want to improve, make your application more powerful, I have a course on grant writing. There's a link in the description for a beautiful discount that you can use. Now there's one problem with all of the tips in this video and that is that if you follow the, the road that is less traveled by, if you are using your living room room in a strange way to make art with strange decorations and a chaotic mess and all of that stuff and you're constantly following your curiosity you're constantly doing these things that other people don't seem to do you're constantly creating this lifestyle that is different from everybody else's lifestyle then something will happen people will criticize you your friends will start to treat you to some extent as an outcast they will they will criticize your ways i recently for example followed my curiosity and went in to do some day game type of stuff i told this to my friends and oh man all of them oh literally all of them started dashing me on my face started laughing with it belittling it uh, pushing it away pushing it aside. like that's just the way it is. If you follow your curiosity and you do something that nobody else is doing, that is going to happen. And I have one piece of advice for all of you artists out there that want to do that, that original type of life. Bees don't waste their time explaining to flies why honey is better than shit. If you want to go on that hunting trip, go on that hunting trip. If you want to do something strange like day game or follow your curiosity, just follow that curiosity. If you want to wear pink as a man, wear pink as a man. If you want to do ballet, ballet, a women's sport, as a man, just do ballet for a year. It doesn't f***ing matter. If you want to start a YouTube channel, start that YouTube channel. It doesn't f***ing matter. Because the naysayers will be there. They will always be there. And they will always make themselves heard. And when that happens, just remember that bees don't waste their time explaining to flies why honey is better than shit. That said, get the hell out of here.